everyday witches emerge from the shadows of secrecy. Broom closets are flinging open and witches are taking flight. Whether you are hiding in your cozy closet or flying with pride, stay for a spell as witch casting with Theodora Pendragon and her guests share magical moments, stir the cauldron and debunk misinformation and misconceptions about paganism, witches and our wonderful world of magic. Hello again, this is Theodora Pendragon, and today I have a special guest, Ron Padron. Welcome, Ron. Ron is the creator of White Rose Witching. Ron, do you want to talk about what that means? Yeah, White Rose Witching started at the beginning of 2020 as an Instagram account. I'm really bad at sticking with journaling. It's something that I've tried on and off, and it never really, I always forget about it. Um, but I'm a very visual person. And so I decided to create this Instagram account as a way to track my spiritual practice or things that I come across in the world that make me really reflect or pause. I named it White Rose, which was inspired by, so a lot of my spirituality is very much rooted in sort of social justice activism and spiritual activism. And so I named it White Rose Witching in honor of actually the White Rose resistance movement during World War II. That was a university student-led anti-Nazi resistant movement within Germany. It was very short-lived. They published a few pamphlets, but, and it was closer towards the end of the war, but they were really pulling on German religious identity about trying to point to everything that the Nazi regime was doing was so abhorrent and contrary to what it meant to be a good religious person that um, they were making such an impact that it actually made it all the way up to like German high command. And so like the SS was specifically trying to find them. Um, and they were having such a cultural impact that actually their final leaflet, most of them were actually executed before the final leaflet was published. But so their final leaflet was actually published by the allies in airdrops. That's very Germany. interesting. I haven't heard of them. Yeah. And so they really have been fascinated by their story for a very long time. And so when I was trying to come up with a name for this project that I was doing, that just immediately jumped to mind. And, and truth be told, White Rose Witching, the reason I landed on Witching was just because I liked the alliteration of how that sounded. So that part is just, I liked how it, it is a catchy a name. <laughs> yes. Yeah. What exactly is spiritual activism? There's a lot of different ways that you can approach that. And um, there's, so a lot of my experience with it, there's some friends who really got into it through liberation theology, specifically out of like the Jesuit type of ministry. And liberation theology is something that was really developed and it's really present in a lot of Latin American countries and communities. It was really born out of that. And it is this, so that aspect of it takes the idea of spirituality as the reason why we do the things that we do. Some folks might be familiar with Reverend William Barber, who does, who leads the poor people's campaign right now. So that's a really good example of spiritual activism where the motivating factor of why you're seeking justice or why you're pushing for liberation for all is because that is what your spiritual compass or your cosmology calls for you to do. So I mentioned the White Rose resistance group before. To me, they're an example of spiritual activism because what made them realize what is happening is wrong and we are called to confront and condemn this wrongness was their understanding of how their Christian faith was supposed to manifest in the world. Um, so for me, spiritual activism is activism, whether it's environmental activism, social justice activism, or what have you, that the genesis of it is your particular spirituality. I hesitate to say like spirituality or religiosity as an institution, just because I really think it is really deeply rooted with the individual. Now you are of Cuban heritage, correct? And how does that play into correct. your spirituality? Yep. 
Yeah. I live in the Mid-Atlantic now. I've lived here for actually just over a decade, but I was actually born in South Florida and I was raised in Florida and I was born to, my mom is a Cuban refugee and my dad is a native Floridian, but his family are also immigrants, um, uh, predominantly from Spain. But I grew up most of my mom's side of the family and it was very small because it was just my mom and her parents. My great grandmother was alive up until I was in fifth grade. And so she was a very big presence in my life. And then my uncle who was born in the States. So it was really small and we spent a lot of time together. Um, and I was raised Roman Catholic, but within sort of that Latin American, Caribbean sort of culture, I didn't realize this because I was around it. I was just in it, but it's a very distinct and different type of Catholicism. There's a lot of emphasis on the saints, the saints as intermediaries. There's a lot more superstition. I think folks who might be familiar with like Latin American fiction, like literature, a lot of that is rooted in like magical realism, which when we were reading those sorts of books in my English classes, like in high school and things like that, there was a lot of interesting conversation from like non-Hispanic peers. And to me and my other like Hispanic peers, we're just like, this is just how it is. This is how we live our lives. So I grew up with ghosts are real and there are certain things that you don't do because you don't want to invite them in. But then also here's how you um, can use different sort of, it was almost folk Catholic, here are the different charms or things you do to protect yourself. But it, my my grandmother is very devoutly Catholic, but her mother, was so my great grandmother, that it was her mother. She was a little bit more, I never really got a lot of confirmation on it, but my mom has told me that she was a Santiara, so like a century of priestess. Um, and I guess growing up and stuff like that, she would always, my grandmother would always get mad at her because she would find like little shrines in her closet and she wouldn't find them because my great grandmother was leaving like fruit offerings and then she'd forget <laughs> about them and they were like rough. So she was like, what's that? And so that was always there and part of it. I grew up hearing stories about how my mom became a teenager and she would come home late and stuff like that. My great grandmother would be there waiting for her. And when my mom would come in the house, my great grandmother would like shuffle around her, puffing a cigar and like throwing holy water on her because she thought she was like just trying to purify or cleanse her or something and so all of that was just around me and made sense and i didn't really realize the difference was until so i'm a gay man and i'm married and i've been with my husband we've been married for a little over six years but we've been together for about a decade he's irish catholic and so when we got to that point in the relationship we were talking about stuff like i was like i would mention something thinking it was just like what catholics do and he would look at me like i have no idea what you're talking about this is so weird yeah and and i remember so the so a big thing and i don't know if it's outside of the latin or hispanic community as well is uh, like my family has a patron saint and so my grandparents' patron saint is St. Barbara, Santa Barbara. And they have this big statue of her. She has her shrine. It's actually interesting The growing up, there was this credenza that they use in their house as her sort of like altar space. And when they downsized in their house into a smaller apartment, they got rid of the credenza, but they gave it to me. And then, so then that got co-opted and now the credenza is my actual altar space. It's what I use. But growing up in December is when Santa Barbara, I forgot the exact day, but it's when her feast day is. And because she had the altar and stuff like that's where everybody who venerated Santa Barbara and like the neighborhood, the community where my grandparents live, everybody would go there. All the kids would get put in the back room with a stack of Disney VHSs and snacks. And we're like, all right, you guys stay there. Don't come out front. And they would hold an all night vigil with like candles and stuff. So these sorts of like ritualistic aspects really i think was a certain level of a certain type of catholicism that made it very easy for me to segue into witchcraft or paganism eventually then circle back to like more folk catholic practices especially one that utilizes a lot of folk saints which i think is another big thing in latin american and hispanic communities is there's a lot of saints that quote unquote saints that are not sanctioned by the church but they're like folk saints, which I think a lot of people will look at as like spirits of place, genius loca, that are in some ways forms of ancestor veneration. They're just like people who were big in the community for good or for ill, who once they pass, they become 
locally venerated and treated as if they're a saint and can perform. My first husband was from Puerto Rico. And so around his family, when we went to their homes, they all had altars. They had the candles and they talked about ghosts. They talked about healing. They talked about candle magic. And that was all very normal. Yeah. My mom went through some health stuff when I was younger. And also, so this also primed me for this idea of working with spirits, whatever they might be in an approach to working with unseen entities or spirits of the other world, however folks talk about it in their respective cosmologies in a way that wasn't like power over, but power with. And so my mom had some health stuff going on. And so my grandmother prayed to St. Jude and said, pretty much made a bargain. It was like, if you help my daughter and help her through this and keep her safe, keep her alive, make her healthy again, then every Friday, is it every Friday, every Monday, I don't remember, I'll wear white. And so I'm, how old am I? So this was almost 30 years ago. And to this day, whatever, I think it's every Friday, my grandmother wears white and she still has, she has her main altar with Santa Barbara and stuff like that, but she has other smaller, another smaller, like chest of drawers at the top has become an altar space pretty much where she has the candle for St. Jude things. She also associates St. Jude with me and my uncle and stuff like that. We also learned, I also learned early on the power of cursing and curses because um, my family jokes that we have what we call the Good Friday curse. My, like I said, my uncle's born stateside. He's also gay. Um, he was like a club kid in the 80s and stuff like that. And when I was, this was probably in the early 90s and everybody was still living in Miami and he decided like the night of Good Friday, he was going to go out clubbing or something like that. And my grandmother said, don't go out. And he was still living with them. He was still, um, she's like, don't go out. That's disrespectful. What have you? So he went out clubbing and then he ended up getting to a really bad car accident. Luckily he was fine. He had to go through some extensive surgery and stuff like that. But then ever since then, any good Friday, when any, whenever anybody in our family goes out on good Friday, that isn't either for work. Cause you have to go out for work or to church. Like something bad always happens. And it's never to the point of somebody getting like physically injured or hospitalized, but it's cars breaking down for no reason, those sorts of stuff. So we always joke that my grandmother cursed us all with the Good Friday curse. She hates it. She's like, I didn't do that. I don't do that sort of stuff, whatever. But we're like, but it's such a part of our family lore now that in the days leading up to Good Friday, there's like a group text that goes around. It's don't forget, Good Friday is this week. Don't go out. So with your white rose witching, it's a public platform, right? And correct. Yes. As far as coming out of the broom closet, was there a process for you? Because you came out of two closets, right? The rainbow closet and the broom closet. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. And a lot of what I talk about in both spaces where I'm talking about queer activism or where I'm talking about sort of spirituality, like witchcraft or paganism, is I always like to remind people too that there's definitely like a coming out part. But part of it also is this continuous sort of, sorry, I don't know what is making this sound like. So what I like to tell people is that coming out in any closet is, there's definitely like the first time you do it. And I think that's what a lot of people refer to, but you're, con- especially in the way that our society is structured now, right now, currently, you're always in a space where you're constantly coming out of little closets all the time. I don't know that I ever really did a coming out of the broom closet. I think I have a little bit with some folks, like I tell people, but especially over the last, let me phrase that. I think when I was first practicing paganism, I was much more shy or nervous about people's perceptions of it. I was also living in the South at the time. This was 20 years ago when I first started practicing. It's more of a, I'm public about it, but I don't make a big deal about telling people. It's one of those things where it's if you find out and it comes up in conversations, if it's relevant, if you come over to my house and see my altars, the library space that we have downstairs in our basement, one whole library, one whole bookshelf is just books on paganism or witchcraft or things like that. So if you are invited into my life, it's something you're going to find out about or know about if that's not how we met. So it's not something, and I actually really like that was my approach to it because I think my experience being an out gay man 
and coming out. And then every time I start a new, I've started a new job, I've had to come out and office and stuff like that is very much construed in a way where it's, I have pictures of me and my husband, there's a pride flag. So I'm very conscious of the way that I construct the spaces that I'm in professionally or otherwise. So that way I don't have to tell you that I'm gay. It's just you walk in and you're like, okay, but it just takes the burden off of me if I need to do that. And I think because I got tired of that continuous coming out process as a gay man, I maybe subconsciously or what was like, I'm not going to do that as a witch or as a pagan. I'm just going to be that. And if you don't, it's not because I'm hiding it from you. It's because it just never came up in our relationship or hasn't come up in our relationship yet. So right now you're pursuing a community ministry certificate. Is that correct? And that's through Cherry Hill Mm -hmm. Seminary. Yeah. Through Cherry Hill Seminary, I started it a year ago. So beginning of 2022. It's something I'd wanted to do for a long time. Actually, when I was little, the church that we belonged to, we didn't have an actual church. We went to a community center. The last year that I lived in Miami, they actually probably built the real church. I was an altar server because my dad was an altar server growing up. And there was a decent stretch of time when I was in elementary school where I actually wanted to be a priest. I'd been thinking about what does that look like now, like at the, where I am in my life and what my spirituality looks like and the spaces I occupy. Uh, what does that look like? My job has always been, um, and I get this from my parents. They've worked, they've always, they've both worked in very sort of service. Really, my dad was a firefighter and paramedic and stuff like that. So being of service to community is something that's just, I think, in my bones. So I'd been thinking about it for a while. I, I would find myself every few months going back to the Cherry Hill website, looking at their various programs. And finally, I was like, you know what? I just got to do it. So I started it. It's an online program. It takes about 15 months. It can take longer depending on how long it takes for you to do. Cherry Hill is a really great organization. They've been around for a while. It's a pagan seminary. So it's structured um, as a seminary. They have multiple programs you can do through it. They are accredited. So I'm doing the community ministry certificate, but you can do a master's of divination through there if you want to. They also have a spiritual direction program that you can do if you want to become somebody who can offer. It's almost like being a spiritual mentor, a spiritual therapist. And I'm actually part of their program and the end of their program, they have to do a practicum if you're going to become like a licensed clinician. And I actually am volunteering. And for one of the people who's in the last part of their program, I'm one of their clients currently. So, and there's short-term courses you can take that if you're just interested in the course offerings that they have, you can just take a course and they have all sorts of interesting things that they offer all the time. Um, and it, it works really well as distance learning, distance education program, which fits. I'm working full time, <laughs> uh, so I can't just stop what I'm doing to just go back to school full time. So this works really well. And they pair you with a mentor that I meet with my mentor monthly. And it's this wonderful woman who lives in Tennessee. And it's been a really challenging program, but in a good way where it's made me have to, it's very interfaith. So you're learning about a bunch of stuff because the idea is that it's preparing you to serve your community in a ministerial role whether it's an official role or an unofficial role. And that means that you you can make the conscious choice when you're done that I work with people in my tradition or what have you. But if you're opening yourself up to, I want to be a resource in my community, it's teaching you how to be able to navigate all the different types of faiths and intersections of faith that you might come across in your community. And one of the things you can actually do as part of this is they have a partnership with Sacred Wall Congregation, which is a a recognized pagan church. They're originally founded and based off of the Greencraft Wicca tradition. I myself am not Wiccan, but they, over the last several years, have really been opening up more to become more inclusive of different paths and traditions. So if you look at the Sacred Wall Congregation's path towards becoming a deacon or an ordained clergy, a clergy person, um, there's an academic component to it in addition to a service component. So I'm currently in my 12 month internship towards ordination and they take the community ministry certificate that Cherry Hill offers as a substitute for their own academic component. So about six months into certificate that I was doing, my mentor and I had a conversation and she really told, got me to look more at ordination. It wasn't something I'd originally planned to do, but because a lot of my spirituality and my practice intersects with 
activism, things like that. She made a really good point that having the credential can open some doors or give me more legitimacy, quote unquote, in certain spaces where folks might look at that as something that I need to have in order to be taken seriously. I think it's great that the pagan community does have credentials. I think that's really important. Now, how did you find Cherry Hill Seminary? You said you kept going back to their website. How did you first find out about them? I honestly don't remember. I think I think I probably found out about them through a pagan pride day that I went to years and years ago. And it was either through a conversation I had with somebody who was maybe engaged in one of their programs or there was like literature that I picked up that had information about them. I honestly don't remember, but it was just one of those things that in passing, it came into my life. And then just every six months or so, I just found myself like thinking about it again. You were supposed to to do it. Yeah. Yeah. The process that I've been going through with the coursework and stuff like that, I can honestly say there's not a single part of my life that hasn't been impacted or touched or made me become more reflective in a good way. And my mentor is great, but she really challenges me and she will pick apart some things, but not in a critical way, just in like a, oh, did you notice what you were saying when you said this? And um, yeah, so it's been an amazing process. And I've actually like talked to a couple of my friends where I'm like, you should look into this. Yeah. And I understand it, it it's, it does cost money. <laughs> like I, I get that. So it's not necessarily accessible for everybody. But if it's something that, that is within your means, yeah. And there's been a, a lot of, I don't know how much people are pay attention to certain conversations that are happening within the community, but there's a really robust conversation that's been going on for a few years about the need, quote unquote, for pagan clergy. Obviously, there are a lot of folks who, what draws them to paganism is the lack of hierarchy and that it's a individualized, experiential sort of spirituality. Um, so they look at conversations of, clergy as maybe taking from religions that they've left or paths that they left and superimposing and saying, well, that's why I left that. I don't want that here, which is totally valid. And I think there's a lot of, there's a lot of conversations that can and should be had around people who are taking trauma from religion, from faith practices or institutions that they've left and just bringing it into paganism with them. But, but there's also, uh, I hate to say it this way, but there's a need for pagan clergy so that way we can be taken in space, taken seriously in spaces where our voices are currently exactly. being taken seriously. Absolutely. As far as like the pagan clergy stuff goes, I also think that it's really important now with sort of the trajectory that there's a lot of different paths that I think that like our country can go down over the next few years. Some of them are scarier than others and some of them utilize the trappings of the language of religion or faith in a way that prioritizes a particular understanding of a particular faith to the detriment of others. And so I think having ordained pagan clergy people that our community can point to and say, these are people who have taken the time to educate themselves on X, Y, Z. We trust them to speak for us, that sort of stuff. I think we need folks like that to be able to enter into those rooms where those conversations are happening to talk about what faith and spirituality mean and looks like in a multicultural society to, to point out when it's not being included. For example, the house speaker vote just concluded the other night and when the minority leader Kim Jeffries was speaking and he, in his speech, he named a number of faiths of you know, talking about the American tapestry and said, you wish we're Christian, we're Muslim, we're Hindu. So it's great that he mentioned something outside of the three Abrahamic faiths, but you never see people in elected office or ever acknowledging paganism or acknowledging people who are in that camp. And so there's still a lot of work to be done. <laughs> and I think people who take the work to become ordained pagan clergy are really well positioned to help do that work. Absolutely. We need a big voice. Yeah. Which, I mean, it's going to be difficult because the pagan world is so broad and so, again, it's so much of an individualized experience, which is, I think, one of the blessings of it, but trying to get consensus around who speaks for who and things like that. 
is is messy, but I think it's worth it. Personally, I don't think it's so much that we're broad. I think the problem is that we're so hidden and there aren't enough of us coming out to speak. True. Yeah. Yeah. Because, yeah, because the space, when I have been in spaces, like when I'm at festivals or conferences and stuff like that, everybody is receptive to and understanding and appreciative of everyone's unique takes on, on, on their paths or their personal experiences. But there's rarely in my experience been a lot of animosity. It's been like, no, I appreciate that. And we're, we're drinking from the same well, we're just using different cups. And I think in general, the pagan community is more accepting that you, know, you may, you know, have your saints and I may have my spirits and my God and goddess. And we're just more accepting of each other and we have different beliefs. And there's, there's a lot of respect where people outside of paganism who don't know about us have these preconceived ideas that are inaccurate. Yeah. No, very much. And I think, so I was actually having this conversation yesterday with a friend. We got together for a bonfire for the full moon and she had some greens left over from Yule that were burning the fire. And we were having a conversation about on AMC today, actually, the Mayfair Witches show is going to start. I love Anne Rice, like early Anne Rice stuff. So I loved the Vampire Chronicles. I loved the new reboot that they did of Interview with the Vampire. Um, and I'm really excited for the Mayfair Witches. I've only read the trilogy, so I don't, I know there's books beyond that, but I just, I'm really excited for that. I've seen some of the promos for it. It looks really like just gorgeous. Um, but there was a, I'm hesitant to say this because there are a lot of people who are involved in this documentary that I respect. I think they did a really good job and I'm not trying to like have people put words in my mouth, but they did like an hour documentary on what is witchcraft or the history of witchcraft that they released on AMC in advance of the show starting. And there was some stuff that was really well done, but then there was some, there were quite a few things that were just painted with very broad brushes. One of them being the rule of three uh, situation where I think a common belief of non pagans about pagans is that all pagans adhere to the rule of three of don't do ill because it comes back on you threefold or however it gets interpreted. A philosophical or religious sort of or spiritual understanding of a particular type of fake, uh, of paganism, um, of a particular brand of paganism, uh, mostly associated with Wicca, but then again, not all Wiccans actually believe that or practice that. So a friend and I were excited for the show, but we we're having this conversation of, oh, the next like six to nine months are going to be intolerable <laughs> because there's going to be just this mass sort of mainstream bandwagoning, I guess, of witchcraft, which her and I are of a certain age where we definitely were really drawn to or felt more comfortable being public about our interest in witchcraft because we were <laughs> teens when the craft came out. So, so we get it. There's like a, there's a space for it. There's understanding. This is us not, we're not trying to be like the older folks being like, oh, these young kids. Um, but now that we have grown up as pagans and we're in this space, we can appreciate representation in media, but we can also understand uh, but how everybody's going to come into pagan spaces. There's a lot of unlearning that you have to do if you come into pagan spaces when your understanding or what brought you in is just what you so see. So you're thinking it's, for some people, it might be a fad after they see this documentary? It might be. I think there's, I think it'll increase interest. And I think you'll have people who will come into it. And then there are people who maybe it was a fad. There's a lot of folks who I think are interested in witchcraft for the aesthetic of it. I get, I guess where I double down on stuff is the craft part of witchcraft. Like there's, you have to do it. Um, there, it's an experiential thing. You have to practice it. There's a reason we use the word practicing witchcraft. Like it is something that you do. Now, that being said, I totally understand the love for the aesthetic of it, whatever, however you interpret that aesthetic. And if that's your interest in it, that's great. And so I think there are some people who come into it who will say, I just like the look of it. I don't want to practice it. There are some people who will come in. I think as time goes on, you'll see some attrition and then not everybody who is swept into it because of like the, their love of the show or what have you will stick with it. Um, and I think the people who stick with it will be the people who actually commit to doing this 
oh, I thought witches did this, or I thought all pagans did this, or whatever, and they come into a space, and then they're like, oh, that's not true. And they're willing to maybe unlearn some things or expose themselves to experiencing things beyond whatever preconceived. It's a belief system. It's a lifestyle. But I've also met people who will say, oh, I did a love spell, so I'm a witch. No, it's, it doesn't work that way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I also have met people who, from my perspective, I'm like, you're a witch. But they would never call themselves a witch. To a certain, when I was job hunting and stuff like that out of grad school, I was having a hard time finding a job. My grandmother, who was a devout Catholic Cuban woman, called me up and she was like, oh, I heard you're really sad because you can't, you're having a hard time finding a job. And I know you're trying everything you can, but is there a bodega by you? And I was like, yeah. She's like, oh, okay, we'll go to the bodega, get this type of candle. And it, uh, it was a Virgin Mary candle, but then she was like, it's a Virgin Mary candle, but it's actually, we're going to do, she's actually can also be like Lukumi or who it was, which Orisha. And I remember that through me. I was like, what? I was like, you don't do this, but uh, it's just a ton. I've known plenty of people who, but from my, from where I stand, I'm like, yeah, you're practicing what could easily be considered witchcraft, but you just see that as something that falls within your Christianity or your Judaism or whatever it might be. There are lots of names for it, but it's pretty much the same thing. We believe in magic. Yeah. Yeah. I think part of it is like, if you look at like the history of Christianity and stuff too, I think folks who maybe were raised Catholic or things like that, I think if you're raised in a dominant religious environment that really does have space for because there's so many things that happen in, in, in catholicism and even just the catholic mass that are it's that's magic like you think this thing turned into something else like, that's magic and from a historical perspective that's what brought about like the protestant revolution is people being like there's too much magic left in this so we need to strip it down and not do that um but even then at its simplest form, like prayer is a form of magic. Um, and I often have that conversation with people who, when they find out that I'm a witch and stuff like that, and they world joking, like, oh, so you believe you can do spells? I'm like, well, do you believe that when you pray, it will actually do something? And like just watching the gears turn and them trying to figure out a way to say that, yeah, they think that'll do something, but me doing magic is different. It won't do something. All variations on a theme. It is. It's, it's all the same. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Just different labels. Oh, this has been a nice conversation. Yeah. yeah it was fun. Thank you for being a guest on my show. And it's interesting because when you reached out to me on social media about being a guest on my podcast, we have mutual friends. I noticed that. Yeah. yeah that was have- really we live in a very small community when you think about it. Yeah. Yeah. And that's when I was, that was I mean, talking about coming out of the broom closet and stuff like that. Being in the South 20 years ago, I think I had to make a decision between if I was going to come out of the closet as a gay man or if I was going to come out of the broom closet as a witch. And there was a much more visible gay community. Um, so I felt like I had a place that I could go to. And this was early internet like that's it was the only times that i met was in the wild really was at bookstores because we'd all run into each other at like uh, the one aisle with oh, the cult, the occult books section. or whatever <laughs> oh, the hidden section yeah and so for me it was really difficult to find community down there now where i live now through the internet and through just feeling like i'm in a more secure place where i can put myself out there and actually go to festivals or go to public rituals and stuff like that I found that community, but it's also really interesting to see how small that community is and how far people will travel for it. Like I've gone to Pagan Pride Day. I live in Maryland, and so I've gone to Pagan Pride Day in Maryland and actually gave a workshop last year. And somebody came up to me afterward, and we we're having a really great conversation about it. And they were like, oh, would you ever come and give a workshop at our local Cups chapter? And I was like, yeah, sure. And they, they told me the name of the Cups chapter. I was like, heard of this but i didn't want to say that to them so when i got home i looked it up and it was in like central pennsylvania and i'm like wow okay so it's yeah it's a small community but how 
like how far the connections take you, I think is just something that's so beautiful about it. So. Yes. The pagan community is a beautiful community. Thank you, Ron, for being my guest. It's been a pleasure. Yep. Have a great rest of your day. Thank you for joining us for Witch Casting with Theodora Pendragon. Have a burning question or have a topic you'd love Theodora and her guests to discuss on the show? Contact her through Instagram at Theodora Pendragon. If you enjoyed this episode, make sure to subscribe so you don't miss the next one. And help us spread the word by leaving us a rating and review and sharing it with your friends. See you next time and may your magic always shine.